Okay, so I thought I'd say a couple more things about um, the example we did last time in starting values um, in terms of this weight loss data. Um, and then I want to come back and say another thing about profiling just to uh, give a bit more of a picture of that. So when we're looking at this um, example, Part of the question was, well, how do we find reasonable starting values for the parameters, the beta 0, the beta 1, and the beta 2 here? And I said, well, the t's are sort of between 0 and 200, so maybe beta 2 e above 100 um, will at least put things sort of in the right ballpark. Um, and your process for sort of coming up with that might involve some iteration of sort of trying some things out and seeing what happens. So for example, if we started, if we, if we said, well, maybe, maybe an initial value for beta 2 could be 10. Um, and we plot that. Well, that doesn't look particularly linear when I then plot, um, when I then try and assess whether or not this whole quantity is linear and why it's linear in that whole quantity. Um, and I could, I could go further than that of saying, well, even if I weren't paying attention to this particular plot, I could then... Um, I could then come up with the initial values for beta 0 and beta 1, given my initial guess for beta 2 being 10. And then I could plot and see, well, what does it look like in terms of an actual fit to the data if I actually use those initial values? So if I did use beta 2 equals 10, and then the best values that I can come up with for beta 0 and beta 1 based on beta 2 equals 10, then I get a fit like this. And that already starts to tell me, well, that's probably not a particularly good starting set of starting values. It might end up converging you know, reasonably quickly regardless of that, so it depends on the complexity of the problem. Um, but you can play these sorts of games, and if I, if I made it to be 1,000 and then did the same thing, um, well, it looks like you, know, you could look at the math and see if this makes sense. It looks like that this just gives me basically a linear fit when I, as I let beta 2 get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you know, I could start with that and see what happens. Um, that's probably, you know, that's not as good a starting uh, set of starting values as I used last time. Um, but one of the things that, that we'll be talking about is the idea of, start, of, of trying a few different starting values. And this would address the question, partly trying to help, help address the question of, well, what if our function has local minima as well as the global minimum? Um, and so trying different starting values is often, is, is often a good strategy for, for dealing with that, at least partially. Um, so I'm just going to see what happens if I start with these, this different set of starting values here. Okay, so in this case, it turns out that I ended up with some numerical issues and I made the, the Hessian matrix that I couldn't invert the Hessian matrix. Um, so there's, you know, there are some numerical tricks that, I, that you know, we could deal with in terms of, say, um, using, the, using, using a pseudo-inverse or um, adding, adding a, small set of, a set of small positive values on the diagonal of the, of the matrix to try and make it positive definite. Um, but that's one of the things that, that might happen if you choose a bad set of starting values is that might then lead you to have numerical, numerical difficulties. Okay, so I think that's all I want to start, say about that. Um, any questions at this point? I wanted to make one more comment about profiling, which is I thought it might be helpful with, to do something I didn't do last time, which is just sort of draw a picture of what's happening when you're, when you're profiling. So suppose that um, I have this two-dimensional, I'm trying to optimize over some two-dimensional space, and in this case, I'll just draw in the contours and, um, so that we can sort of get a, get a picture of what's happening if we then try and throw an optimizer at this problem. So if I could actually do the maximization analytically in one dimension, well, suppose that for this value of, say, beta, let's call these things beta 2 and beta 1, if for this, sorry, for this value I can analytically maximize, well then I'm just maximizing along this direction and I might find that this is the maximum along that direction. And then say for this value I can analytically maximize and maybe it's this value and for that one maybe it's this value and so forth. What I'm basically doing is tracing out this line, you know, whatever it happens to look like. And then when I throw my numerical optimizer at the problem, I'm basically optimizing along this path through the space. And so I could, you know, I could sort of think about then, well, what does the profile likelihood look like? Well, that's just for each point along this path, that's just going to be the value of the objective function. And then maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll get something that looks like this if I were to try to sort of draw the, the, um, the function evaluated along that path. Okay. 
So that's basically what's uh, going on there. Um, maybe I'll pause here and see if anybody noticed a contradiction in the few things I've been talking about the last, the last couple of subsections here in terms of how I tackle this example. So I chose to optimize here in three dimensions numerically. Anything else I could have done here? And I should be able to I should be able to do the profile likelihood for this because if I knew what beta two was, or if I fixed beta two, that's just a least squares problem in beta zero and beta one. So I can just I can just come up with the least squares analytic solution for beta zero and beta one. So I I could I could do profiling in, in this problem and reduce it down to a univariate numerical map maximization with respect to beta two. Um, in this problem, it's probably not, maybe not worth your time to do the profiling because this is not a particularly hard optimization problem and the numerical methods will probably work just fine in three dimensions. Um, but often it is going to be worth your, worth your time for harder problems. Okay, so let's move on. We're now going to sort of work our way through a few, a few different ways of numerically optimizing in, in multiple dimensions. And part of the goal of this is just to see some of these different methods and to see that they're all at their core, fairly closely related to just doing Newton Raphson in um, in multiple dimensions. Okay, so there's a lot of sort of uh, terms for different optimization methods that use get used for different statistical problems. Um, there's Fisher scoring, there's Gauss Seidel, there's Gauss Newton. You know, sort of all sorts of different combinations of famous mathematicians. Um, and when I was sort of first learning some of these topics, I sort of learned that, you know, one method here and another method there and another method there. And I didn't really have a very good sense of like, how do all these things tie together? What, you know, it's just sort of a lot of different, a lot of different methods. And so part of my goal here is to basically say, you know, all of these methods are very closely related and we can see what the connections between them are. So that's going to be, I'm going to try and draw that out as one of the themes as we talk through these, these methods. Okay, so, so we've seen basic newton raphson Now let's now there's something called Fisher scoring, which what we're going to see next is just basically a variation on newton raphson okay? um, So we have to go back to what exactly is uh, the Fisher information in the problem. So if you recall from um, your sort of... Uh, first statistical theory course, um, if we take the expected value of the gradient of the log likelihood uh, outer product with itself, that's going to give us the Fisher information. And, on, and under uh, regularity conditions, in particular, if we're dealing with where if f is an exponential family, normal data, Poisson data, binomial data, those sorts of things, then it turns out that you can also, that, that the expected value of the Hessian of the log likelihood so the second derivative is equal to minus the Fisher information. So you can either express the Fisher information in this way, or under particular conditions, you can write the Fisher information in this way, where the Fisher information is just minus the expected value of the, of the Hessian. So the Hessian is going to be some function of both the data and the parameters. I can take an expected value with respect to that uh, matrix, the expected value of each of the elements of the matrix. That's going to get rid of the data from the expression by taking the expected value. And I'm going to be left with something that's just a function of the unknown parameters. So there's also this idea of the, the, that there's something called the observed Fisher information. And the observed Fisher information basically just amounts to plugging in the data instead of taking this expected value. Uh, I'm not sure why I said either expression. Oh, I guess I meant uh, either expression in terms of either of these two uh, expressions. Okay, so what? So the, okay, so that's that's just sort of prefacing for to then say, well, what is um, what's the difference between newton raphson and Fisher scoring? Well, newton raphson is we've already seen this on the slide, but I'll just write it um, write it here just to make the distinction quite clear. Uh, am I getting my notation right? Okay, so we get our gradient, that's going to give us a direction, and then we're going to multiply by the, uh, by the inverse of the Hessian and subtract off, and that's going to do, give us our update from theta t to theta t plus 1. 
So Fisher scoring is very closely related, and it just amounts to saying, well, we know something about how the Hessian and the information relate. So the expected value of the Hessian is just minus the information. So instead of using the Hessian over there, I'm just going to plug in minus the Fisher information. So once I plug minus the Fisher information in, I'm going to get plus, because there was a minus involved there. And um, that's sort of all there is, all there is to it. Um, Sorry, there's a T missing there. Um, so basically, it just amounts to whether you're using the basically the observed Fisher information or the expected Fisher information in doing your Newton-like uh, update to do your to take your next step. So they both have similar convergence. They have the same basically have the same convergence properties, quadratic convergence, um, and people have some intuition that. Um, that in, in, in some problems, Fisher scoring might work better than in others, and the Gibbons and Hayding book suggests that Fisher scoring uh, works better when you're doing your first steps. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make bigger jumps towards the optimum in, in, the, in the initial steps, uh, whereas newton raphson is better towards the end. So I don't know that you'd actually want to combine these, but, but maybe that's something that, that people do. Okay, so any questions about the, um, the sort of abstract presentation of this? So we can see this in an example. So I'm just going to go back to the weight loss example. So what do I need to do? Well, in the weight loss example, what I'd done was I'd, I'd, I'd used our symbolic differentiation capabilities to give me a leg up and not have to do all the derivatives by hand. And so I'm going to basically use what I had derived for the Hessian. And then what I did, basically did was I went into my function and said, oh, I just need to take an expected value and figure out what the expected value of the pieces are that have, and all of the components of that um, Hessian that happen to involve the, the observations. So once I do that, um, I get this as my new uh, Hessian function. And then we can, we can redo the optimization. So actually, what did I, let me see what I had for beta 0. Okay, so let me set beta 2.init back to be 100, which is what we had decided on originally as a reasonably good starting value. Um, okay, so I'm just going to basically run through this problem again. Um, we can look at what the observed and the expected Fisher information are. Um, and it turns out, so this first one is the Hessian, and this second one is, is based on, if I'm going to do... Uh, Fisher scoring, so this is based on the information. So turns out some of these terms are the same because the those terms don't involve the data, so it so they don't change, but some of these other ones are actually somewhat uh, somewhat different between what I would use if I were using this matrix and doing my updates versus what I was do, using doing and using this matrix and doing the updates. And this is just when I evaluated at my initial starting values, so theta zero or theta one, depending on what what notation I'm using. Okay, so now I can just run through um, my updates. In this case, I'm just choosing a fixed number of, of updates, but obviously, as we talked about last time, we would um, ideally, well, well, not ideally, what we, would generally, what we would do in practice is we would have some convergence criterion and we would uh, do the iterations until, until we met those criteria. So in this case, uh, this is what I get for the updates. It takes about four or five iterations until I get pretty close to whatever the, um, the maximum likelihood estimate is. And then at that point, it looks like I'm not really refining very much. I'm you know, refining in the very, very outer, outer digits. Um, so it doesn't, you know, in this particular case, I, I probably don't need more than six or seven uh, iterations to, to reach the maximum likelihood estimate. And I think if we went back and compared to doing it with newton raphson we'd see that this was slightly faster for this particular problem, um, given that we're talking about you know, seven or eight iterations and it happened basically as fast as I, as I could sort of hit return on the computer. Um, in this particular problem, that's, that's really not really particularly important. Okay, so any questions?
All right, so that's Fisher scoring. Um, there's also something called Gauss-Newton for nonlinear least squares um, that is sort of related to Fisher scoring and then it uses the Fisher information also again in place of the Hessian. Um, and if you were to look in the guts of, of the NLS function, which does nonlinear least squares optimization, you would see it's using this algorithm called Gauss-Newton. Okay. Um, the other th comment I wanted to make was to try and make a connection between what's happening um, with basically the um, either the Hessian or the Fisher information matrix um, when we have um, basically when do we have really really high statistical uncertainty and also potentially difficulties in doing the optimization and how are those two ideas related to each other. So suppose we had um, a Fisher information that was in matrix that was nearly singular. Okay, so that means that we have an eigenvalue that's really, really small. And the Fisher information is on the precision scale, so it's the inverse of the covariance. Okay, so that says we have very little precision for some, lin in some, li for some linear combination in some direction in this space that we're optimizing over. So if we think about then taking the inverse of that matrix, what does that mean? Well, the, if we're thinking about these eigenvalues, there's an e at least one eigenvalue that's near zero. We try and take the inverse. That eigenvalue is essentially infinity. So that says we have essentially infinite variance for some linear combination of the parameters, for example, if we're in a, in a parameter op optimization problem. So basically, you can sort of think of that, you know, suppose we're just in two dimensions and we've got a really sort of simple uh, likelihood, the log likelihood. Well, if I'm looking in this direction, this function is really peaked. Okay, that's going to be a fairly easy optimization. Or if I did the negative, you know, I'd be doing the minimization. Um, and I have a lot of information about my parameter value because the likelihood is basically really humped. It says, you know, at the maximum, that's a good value. As I move away from the maximum, that's not a particularly good value for the parameter with respect to fitting the data. But if I look in this direction, I have much less information about what the, what the parameter is. The likelihood is very flat in this direction. And if this got to be flatter and flatter and flatter, then that's basically going to amount to what I was just saying about one of the eigenvalues in the precision matrix is near zero, which means that one of the eigenvalues in the covariance matrix is near infinity. And it's basically just saying that the variance is basically is, is just getting very big in this particular direction. Okay. Um, and it also means that if I'm trying to optimize and I'm sort of somewhere, somewhere in here and I'm trying to find, say, the minimum, which might be here, then I may then I'm, I might run into numerical issues with having the, um, the Hessian matrix not be invertible. Okay. So I, what, what I'm trying to point out here is just this connection between what might be happening in the optimization and trying to think about what's going on statistically in the problem and what does it mean in terms of being able to estimate the parameters and how the parameters relate to each other. And one example of where this would occur is if we had columns in our regression X matrix and our design matrix that were nearly collinear, which basically says, I can't distinguish whether the effect on Y is coming from XI or from XJ, because XI and XJ are basically so highly associated uh, with each other. So that would be one context in which this, in which this could come up. Okay, so the next, the next method I want to talk about is iteratively reweighted least squares or iterative, iterative weighted least squares. You'll sort of see it go by a, a bunch of different terms. So the acronyms are either IWLS or IRLS. Um, and what I want to do here is again show that this is basically just another example of doing some variation on newton raphson So the basic idea is, and I don't want to... Uh, you know, there are whole classes on, on doing on working with GLMs, and I don't want to spend all of our time on this. So I'm going to sort of skip over some of the details, and hopefully we'll just sort of hit the highlights here. Um, but okay, suppose you have a generalized linear model. For example, suppose you have data y that we say come from a Poisson distribution, and there's some linear predictor x beta. And then to get it on a scale where this makes sense to have this be the mean of a Poisson, we exponentiate um, x beta such that this is now necessarily positive, and that can give us a model for Poisson data potentially. 
or we might have binomial data where I would have y, um, say, Bernoulli, or I guess I'll do it as binomial, um, and I pi, and in this case, the standard thing would be to have p be the based on the Loja transformation. <coughs> Okay, so either of these would be sort of the standard GLMs that you would run across in, in doing statistical work. Um, okay, so what does IWLS amount to? Well, it basically amounts to taking the, the data that I've observed and coming up with a new Y to use in place of the data and a weight matrix that has to do with the variance of the observations and then basically finding a weightedly square solution to get beta half. Well, it turns out that the, the y and the w that I use are going to be based on my current estimates of the betas, so this is going to be an iterative algorithm where I'm iteratively solving this weightedly squares problem. So that's, that's sort of what um, iteratively reweighted least squares amounts to. It's sort of a linearization of the, of the problem. So what we're going to see is that this update this style of update in iteratively reweighted least squares is basically just Newton Raphson. Okay. okay, so exponential families um, is a set of distributions that can be expressed in this form, and it includes things like the normal distribution, the Poisson distribution, the binomial distribution, etc. So we won't go into the details, but you can write down models like this in this form based on the data and the parameter theta. And if you have the link function in the, um, in the model in what's called the canonical parameterization, which for the Poisson is actually the log link, so this exponentiation here, and for the binomial is the logit link, um, then it turns out that theta is just going to be eta, and eta is just whatever is in here. And in most you know, standard GLMs, that's just going to be some linear function x beta, just like a, just like a linear regression. Okay, so if, if we make those connections and we, see, and we say, okay, well, theta in, this, in these in sort of standard versions of the problem is just going to be x beta, what we can then do is take the log likelihood and start thinking about using newton raphson okay. So I can, take, I can find the gradient and I can find the Hessian. And if I do that, I'm not going to go through the details, but you sort of work through the details, and what you'll find is the gradient with respect to beta when we've got problems that look like this has this form, and the Hessian has this form, minus x transpose wx, and w is a diagonal matrix where we have the variance of y on the, as the di variance of each y as the diagonal elements. So we've got a vector here, one for each of the observations, where y is a vector, and so is um, expectation of y, and we have this W matrix that had, that is n by n if we have n observations, and both of these things, both uh, both the gradient and the Hessian, are going to depend on the um, depend on the parameters. So we're thinking as usual about a an iterative update. Okay, so the Newton Raphson update in this case, we're just following the you know the standard recipe that we've seen is just to take beta t plus 1 as beta t um, minus the Hessian, but in this case the Hessian is this, and there's a minus in there, so we get plus inverse of the Hessian times the gradient, which is just this, once we do its transpose to get it to be a column vector. So this is the newton raphson update. And um, just to give you a concrete example, if we work through um, what the weights and what the expected value are for the binomial case, well, we just have that the weights in the binomial case are just p times 1 minus p, in this case at the teeth iteration for the ith observation. Um, and, oh, it looks like I am writing this down for the Bernoulli case instead of the binomial case because there's no n in here. But the expected value of y is just going to be p, and that's just going to be this uh, transformation based on the logit. Okay, so the question is, how does that, the standard newton raphson update, I mean, standard iteratively re weightedly squares update looks like this, where we have this weight matrix, and then we've got the, what are called the working observations, and that has this form, which I'll try and give a little bit of intuition for in a minute. 
So we can relate the that Newton Raphson update to that to this standard representation of the updates in iteratively rewavedly squares by just doing a little bit of um, algebra. So we start out with beta t plus one is beta t plus x transpose w t x inverse x transpose times y minus the expected value of y at the teeth iteration. So I'm basically just going to pre and post multiply beta by beta by the inverse of this matrix and then the matrix itself. So I'm going to have x transpose wt x inverse x transpose wt x times beta t plus that same thing again. Okay. So I'm just going to factor out the inverse matrix. And then also um, factor out x transpose w. So now I've got x beta t plus, um, let's see, wt inverse, since I need to have those cancel because there's no w uh, over in this uh, term. And then I've got, um, let's see, so this x transpose came out there. Okay, so now I've just got y minus the expected value of y at the teeth iteration. Um, okay, and now if we look at what the standard iteratively reweighted least squares uh, update uh, formula looks like, well, it's just what we have there, except now this thing in that notation is just being called W T tilde. So these are the working observations. So try and get a little bit of intuition here. So this is just a weighted least squares problem. Why do I have the weights? Well, if I have a generalized linear model, it's not a homoscedastic model like a normal regression would be. I have different variances for the different observations. So I need to have weights in there to deal with the fact that I've got homoscedasticity in my um, in, in sort of the least squares formulation of the problem. And then what's this? Well, this, these are the working observations. So I can't, you know, I can't directly regress on the y's when they're, you know, Poisson count, count type data or zeros and ones. But what this says is it sort of makes sense to regress on a transformed version of the observations. And what's the transformation? Well, it's just to take the current estimate of the, estimate of the mean plus an estimate of the residual of the actual observations minus the current estimate of the mean. But I'm going to do some weighting again to sort of account for the heteroscedasticity. So I'm basically saying sort of what's my, in a sort of linearized version of the problem, what is my sort of current, esti current value estimates for, for what the data are in this sort of linearized version of the problem, and then I'm just going to solve that least squares problem in a, in, a weighted, uh, in a weighted fashion. So I think, you know, sort of the main point of, of going through this and getting to this was just to say, you know, this is not all that mysterious if we think about it from the perspective of, well, we've been talking about newton raphson this is basically, this is just newton raphson but reformulated to sort of put it in sort of this sort of statistical least squares kind of uh, formulation of the problem. Okay, are there any questions or comments about that? Okay, so now what I want to do is um, switch over and start talking about um, basically sort of generic Newton-like uh, methods. So we, when we're talking about, um, so Fisher scoring is sort of comes up in, in the context of, of likelihood maximization. Iteratively, iteratively reweighted least squares comes up in the context of um, GLMs. The idea is now to talk about sort of general methods that are like doing Newton-Raphson, but basically are sort of improvements upon doing Newton-Raphson and deal with some of the, the issues that come up in doing Newton-Raphson. And to see it, see a variety of different algorithms that can be placed in this framework of basically 
I choose a direction and then I choose how far to go in that direction and then I take my next step by choosing the next direction and choosing how far to go in that direction. Okay, so a Newton-like method is one that looks like this, where I've got my update is from xt to xt plus 1 based on the gradient, some matrix mt that I invert that's basically playing the role of what we've seen as the Hessian, and then some alpha t that basically sort of scales how far I'm going to walk in, in the uh, direction that I'm choosing. Um, and so the idea is that instead of being sort of slavishly devoted to doing newton raphson precisely as, as we derive newton raphson I might come up with different things that I use in place of the Hessian. So I might sort of say, well, maybe I want to do, use some computationally efficient approximation to the second derivative instead of re recalculating the second derivative at every single update. And maybe I want to um, you know, have some, some um, checks in there to make sure that I'm not going uphill or going too far in the direction that I choose. And maybe I, you know, that sort of relates to this. I might want to scale things so I don't go too far in any, in any particular direction. So the idea is to sort of take newton raphson and sort of make it somewhat more general and more flexible. OK, so let's first talk about sort of a basic descent method where we, where we do something really simple. So all I'm going to do here is say, OK, um, and, it's, and it's most simplest. All I want to do is I want to say xt plus 1 is xt plus some scaling times some direction. So pt is a vector, and that, that, that will just tell me what direction I'm going in. And then alpha t says how far to go in that direction. And then I'm just going to repeat this over and over again. So if I choose a direction, I could just do a line search in that direction and find the minimum along that line. And that will tell me how, where to go. And that, that will tell me how far to go. I get there, and now I go and I choose a new pt, a new direction, and I choose how far to go in that direction. So that would be sort of the, um, the simplest thing I can do. Well, then, if I'm thinking about this, well, how do I know what direction to go in? Well, why don't I just choose use the gradient? Because the gradient is basically going to tell me the steepest direction uphill. So I'll just use minus the gradient. That kind of makes sense. I just I want to walk downhill, right? I'm trying to minimize. I'm trying to, to, to minimize the, the function. So, um, so I'm, I'm sort of sitting here. I say, OK, I know something about where I'm sitting. I can figure out sort of what's the steepest direction downhill. I'm just going to walk that way until I reach the minimum in that direction and then continue, continue onwards. So that seems pretty intuitive. And it's not a terrible thing to do. Um, but it turns out if you actually look at what the contours of, of functions look like, you often will end up zigzagging towards the minimum if you, if you follow this recipe. So this still, I mean, sometimes to me, this doesn't feel all that intuitive that that would be the case. Like, I feel like, you know, when I'm walking around in, in the woods or something, I feel like, OK, isn't the fastest thing to do just going to be sort of to just you know, choose the direction that goes downhill and that? feels like I'm just going to be able to sort of walk down the valley and not have to not do a lot of zigzagging. Um, but if we actually look at problems, what we'll see is that, it, look at real, real objective functions, what we'll see is that we do actually zigzag. So let's actually see that as, as an example just to try and um, sort of firm up our intuition here. OK, so I'm going to define just an elliptical function here. So if you have circular contours, then it's fine just to work straight, walk straight downhill and that'll work. And it'll basically get you to the, to the minimum um, right away. The problem comes about if you have elliptical contours, which is a standard thing that will, will arise when you're, when you're optimizing. So I'm just going to define a basic quadratic function here as the function I'm trying to optimize. So you can see this is just quadratic in uh, x1 and x2. And then I'm going to get the, I'm going to, I just derive the gradient function for this um, two dimensional elliptical function. Um, and then I have a little line search function, and I'm going to use the optimize function that, to just optimize in whatever direction I choose. So I'm going to calculate the gradient. That'll tell me what direction to go. I'm then, uh, then going to do the full optimization in that direction to find the actual minimum in that direction, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to repeat the process. So that's, that's all I've done. I've just coded up that, what I just described in words. And... I'm just going to plot a representation of the function. So this is the function I'm trying to optimize. Doesn't look like it's all that hard to optimize. Like it looks like if I start here, I should just be able to sort of, you know, suppose I walk in this direction, it seems like the minimum is going to be here. And then it looks like I should just be able to say, oh, it looks like the minimum is going to be this direction. It seems like I should just be able to sort of walk straight this way. Okay. Turns out if you sort of look at the contours and see what this does, if you actually implement it, that's not actually what happens. Um, so 
here's what actually happens. And let me see if I can get this big enough so we can actually sort of see the colors and help, help have that help us see what's going on here. Um, I don't know if you guys at the back can see. So suppose this is my starting value. Sort of the contours at this point look sort of like this. So this is the best direction to go. And if I walk this way, you can sort of see here are the contours. So the minimum point is right here. Okay? But now if I look at these contours, well, in this case, the contours are sort of shaped this way, and I, and, I, and I choose to walk this way. But I don't actually sort of keep walking down the valley. I'm sort of, sort of going along the side here because of the information I had about the gradient at this particular point. So I walk this way, and the best thing I can do is eventually I get to here, and that is actually the minimum along this line. But you can see I'm not taking a particularly direct path towards where I really want to go. So I get here, and now I look at what, what the contours look like here. Well, the contours here, just at this point, are sort of looking like this. So this is the downhill direction once I get here, and it turns out I walk this far. And so you sort of keep repeating this path, and you keep doing this, and you sort of zigzag in towards the minimum. So that's not the best thing I can do because of the fact that what I'm basically doing is I'm sort of blindly proceeding based on just saying what's the gradient here where I am without really knowing about what's the gradient going to be in the place where I'm walking to. Um, and the idea of using the Hessian is that this is the gradient here, but the gradient's actually changing throughout this picture. And I want to I make use of the Hessian to say something about how is the gradient changing so that I don't just directly walk downhill, but I walk in a direction that respects the fact that I know something about, not only about the gradient here, but I know something about how the gradient is changing at any given point based on having the second derivative information. So that's sort of one way of thinking about why do I not want to just do steepest de descent in the direction of the, of the gradient and, and ignore the, the Hessian or the second derivative information. Another way of thinking about the Hessian is it's basically transforming the problem into one that's appro that approximately has circular contours instead of elliptical contours. So that's another sort of perspective on what we do when we're, when we're actually doing newton raphson So any questions about this example here? Okay, so that was um, just to try and get some intuition for that. Um, Okay, so a more, a more powerful algorithm is going to be, okay, let's not just walk directly downhill. Let's account for, uh, for second derivative information. We're not going to use exactly the Hessian here, but we're going to choose something in here that approximates the Hessian or the second derivative matrix. And that's basically going to tell us how to refine, basically how to refine the gradient so that we're not just blindly sort of walking downhill just in, one, in, in that particular direction. Okay, so... Um, Let's see, I think I'm going to skip over that. Um, okay, so these methods go by names like, uh, they sort of fall in the framework of things that are called quasi-Newton methods, so they're based off of this idea of using he the Hessian, but they're not blindly sort of just using the Hessian directly. Okay, so one of, one of the um, ways that we, we do a variation on using the Hessian is we don't recompute the entire Hessian at every step of the, every step of the process, and the idea being that sort of computationally um, expensive to do that. And we already know something about the Hessian from the step that we're at. So the idea is if we, if we know the Hessian here and we take a step in a given direction, the Hessian at this new point is probably not going to be all that much different than the Hessian at the old point. And in fact, if, we're if we ended up walking from here to here, by having evaluated the function here and evaluated the function here, I know something about a numerical estimate of the derivative in this particular direction. So I can take the estimate of the Hessian I have here add on the information I have about the derivative in this direction and get a new updated estimate of the Hessian at the new, at the t plus one iteration. So that's the basic idea of um, a lot of these sort of quasi-Newton methods. Um, and if I, if, I, if I updated based on basically that gradient in just that direction that I happen to move from xt to xt plus one, that would be a rank one update. So one way to update from whatever I have as my mt to my mt plus 1 is to make sure that mt plus 1 satisfies this equation, um, where this is going to be a vector, this is going to be a vector, and this is going to be a matrix. And you can sort of intuitively think that this makes sense, because if I divide both sides by xt minus plus 1 minus xt and move that over here, what do I have? Well, I have the gradient, or the change in the gradient over the step size, and that's just basically a, a secant numerical estimate 
of what the second derivative is in that particular direction. So the idea is, is to do this update in a way that, that, that satisfies this secant condition that basically accounts for that new information I've gotten about the derivative in that direction. Um, so there's sort of a bunch of notation here, and um, I don't want to go into all the details, but basically it turns out that, that um, if you use this notation where you define st to be the, the change in xt to xt plus 1 and yt to be the change in the gradient, then there is a uni unique symmetric rank 1 update that satisf satisfies that secant condition, and the, the update is to do this. So you go from mt to mt plus 1 by adding on this. You should be able to see that this is a rank 1 update because this is a matrix that's an outer product so, um, of, of two vectors. Um, and there are conditions on when, when this mt plus 1 will be, uh, will be positive definite. So that would be one approach you can take. Turns out folks have derived um, these guys, Broden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, and Shano, BFGS, have, de have derived a, a rank 2 update that does something along these lines. Uh, waving my hands here a little bit. And the, the rank 2 update that gets used in the BFGF, BFGS algorithm is this, where again, it still involves the ST and the YT that we, that we defined up there. So it turns out if you, one of the uh, standard um, methods for optimizing in R using the optim function is called, quote, BFGS, and it's precisely this Newton-like uh, method. Um, let's see. Okay, so what would you need to do here? I just want to make a couple comments about these M matrices. So one is you need to come up with an initial M0, and that'll sort of get you started along this process. So the Lang book suggests that you could um, use as a starting point some, you could uh, estimate the expected information and use that as, as a starting value for this, for this M0 matrix and then you, you know, you'd go from M0 to M1 to M2, et cetera, using the recipe that we just described. The other thing that I want to point out is that at the end of the day, if we're optimizing a likelihood, we get to the optimum, that's our maximum likelihood estimate. And then generally what's, what we're often going to do is we're going to use the inverse of the Hessian to estimate our asymptotic covariance matrix. Well, at that point, we do want to actually spend the effort involved to actually get a good estimate of the Hessian such that when we invert it, we have a good estimate of the asymptotic covariance. So we wouldn't want to use the M matrix that we arrived at at the end of the iterations directly to then invert to get the asymptotic covariance because that's just an estimate that we've been sort of using for computational convenience. So just to point out that, that once we've gotten to the optimum, we presumably would want to actually calculate the actual, uh, the actual Hessian. Okay, any questions or comments? I'm trying to remind myself where it is that I have a sort of extended example I'm going to do, but I think I'm going to do that once we get to talking a little bit about more, a little more about the functions in R. Um, yeah, okay. So... I guess the last thing I'll mention today is something called gauss -Seidel, um, which is also called backfitting or coordinate descent. Um, and the basic idea of gauss -Seidel is sort of going back to, um, it, it's sort of in some ways going back to when we were talking about choosing steepest direction, except it's sort of even simpler than that, which is that, and that's sort of the, the one of its advantages, is it's just very conceptually simple, is I'm trying to optimize in the space, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, instead of even trying to figure out a good direction to go, I'm basically just going to cycle through all of the directions along the axes of the coordinate space. And so I'm going to, so suppose I'm optimizing in x1, x2, and x3. Well, I'm just going to choose the x1 direction. I'm going to optimize with respect to x1 and, and find the minimum in that direction. Then I'm going to, uh, from there, I'm going to choose the x2 direction and optimize in that direction. Then I'm going to choose the x3 direction and optimize in that direction then I'm going to repeat the process and go back to x1. So I'm just basically moving along the coordinate axes, or moving parallel to the coordinate axes and doing my, my optimization. So a couple of comments about that. One of them is that's um, also going to do some zigzagging like we saw with steepest descent. And the other comment is if we're, if we're in the middle of these, these optimizations, if we're in the middle of these iterations, 
you probably don't want to spend a lot of computational time finding the exact minimum in the particular direction that you're going because all you're going to do is you're going to find that exact minimum and then you're just going to choose a new direction to go and go off in that new direction. And so it's not probably not really going to matter if you're doing some optimization. And suppose I'm here and I'm going in this direction. Does it really matter if I find the precise optimum in this direction and then I choose my new direction to travel from here? You know, what if I'm right here? That's probably going to be good enough. Uh, you know, this is more, you know, reasonably close to the minimum in this direction, and now I choose my new direction. So part of this is you probably don't want to uh, be, be precisely searching for the minimum in any direction that you travel. But in the examples that I'm showing, that is what I've been doing just for, for the sake of simplicity. Okay, so one example where Gauss-Seidel comes up is if you're fitting a generalized additive model. So you have um, a model for observations where you say, I have some nonlinear function in each of the directions in each of the covariates. So suppose I'm regressing income on education and um, uh, age and some other variables, and I say, well, income is just going to be some smooth function of the amount of education you have plus some smooth function of the age that you are plus smooth functions potentially of other, other covariates. And the idea of, um, of backfitting is basically to just optimize in, just find, with, a, with current estimates of the other Fs, find my current best estimate of F1 by taking the residuals Y minus these other current estimates. And that'll get me an estimate of F1. And then I'll go on to F2, and given the estimates of F1, F3, and the other ones, I'll get my best estimate of what the F2 function is, and I'll basically just cycle through all of the different uh, covariates, the functions of the covariates in that manner. So that's sort of one example of doing a Gauss-Seidel type of, of update, where I'm just going in particular predefined directions. So let's just see an example of what this looks like, again, going back to our sort of silly toy elliptical example. So remember when we did um, steepest descent, it looked like this. And if we do Gauss-Seidel, same function, um, except here I'm just defining F1 and F2 are going to allow me to do the optimization in the coordinate directions. Um, let's see here. So suppose that I do this, and what am I doing here? Well, I've written a little bit of code that does this, does the iterations where within each iteration I'm going to go in the x1 direction and then in the x2 direction. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm optimizing my function in the, F1, in the, in the first direction uh, given the current estimate of um, uh, of x2, and then I'm switching and optimizing in the f2 direction during given the current estimate of x1. So if I go ahead and do that, what I end up with is something that looks like this. So not particularly efficient, but it, you know, it does get the job done, and, and it's very you know, simple to code up and simple to think about. You know, I start here. It turns out because I decided to go in this direction first, I actually sort of go in a way that sort of looks like I'm going in the wrong direction, sort of, but that is actually downhill, and it reaches the local minimum. And then I search in this direction, and the local minimum is here, and then I search in this direction, and the local minimum is here, and I basically end up zigzagging my way towards the minimum. So let me close there, and then what we'll see next time is a method called Nelder Mead that basically does searching in high dimensional spaces without needing any derivative information, and that's sort of a counterpart to these Newton-like methods.